create funds to help in a com you know, community service, and create youth organizations, uh, create safety, and, and control blight. So we're looking, we're going through the budget process right now as a city, uh, and this youth ad, uh, ad hoc committee basically is going out and listening to people like yourself. We're gonna have another meeting on the 21st for parents and youth to be able to come and speak. Uh, and we're looking to listen to the community as to what services are missing. What services could we add that would benefit our community? And so uh, we're here to listen today and ask questions. So thank you all for coming out. Uh, anything you wanna add, Lamar? Thank you all for coming out. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, if I can, I think it's loud enough in here that I don't need a microphone. So, but if you can just project your voices so that uh, it captures your uh, uh, sound, uh, so that we can record these and uh, and and be as transparent as possible, so that uh, so that folks know that we're what we're doing in our in our ad hoc committee and that we're what we report back to the city council through the budget process is at least captured and, and the community can also give input as well. And so this has been a long journey for myself and Ron Bernal, our city manager. Uh, we started on this uh, effort through Measure W, uh, probably about now we're, that, me that process started about a year and eight months ago, almost two years now. Uh, and we went out and surveyed the community and they made their, their concerns pretty clear and they said they wanted uh, us to focus on uh, public safety, quality of life, uh, youth programming, quality uh, safe water, and, uh, and there was one more in there that I forget. Uh, but in terms of Measure W, uh, public safety, um, youth programming, and, and, and quality of life were a high priority. So as soon as it passed, we got to work again, and the mayor fought to be on this committee. So I I'm, I'm excited that, 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 uh, that, that, uh, that he's here with us. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that the input that we get from, from all of you and your expertise can help us, uh, not only in, um, providing some youth programs, but also building stronger relationships with our school district uh, so that we're, our mission is always focused on the youth. Uh, not, and it's just that simple, I think. So with that, I think we're turning it over to my new friend, Michael Dunn, the CEO of the Boys and Girls Club, Contra Costa County. Uh, thank you, sir. So good morning, everyone. So I am Michael Dunn. I am the, actually the new CEO for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Contra Costa. And I want to take a, a few minutes to kind of explain a little bit of my background because I think it's a little bit different and, and, and unique in terms of uh, nonprofit and, and, and youth services. I come from the private sector. So I come from the corporate side of mergers and acquisitions and organizational development. But I've been involved with the Boys and Girls Clubs of America organization for about 25 years. And for me, it, it's, I've lived in Sumter, South Carolina. I've lived in Goldsboro, North Carolina. I've lived in Houston, Texas. Lived in Chicago, Illinois. Lived in Nottingham, England. Lived in Peachtree City, Georgia. And Los Angeles, California. And now I live in Pinole. And for me, all of those locations, I've always gotten involved with youth and youth development and really going into underserved areas. So I've really gotten a sense of uh, the need, right? And so for me, uh, my education, I'm an industrial engineer undergrad and, and I have my MBA, my master's in business administration. So my approach to the Boys and Girls Club of Contra Costa is one that is about performance and outcome-driven performance measurements. And so for me, what I'm gonna share a little bit today is sort of the vision that I have for, for, for Contra Casa. And it's, it's been interesting because a lot of times I've been sort of analyzing where we're, where we're at and, and what we have and become, you know, emerge as an acquisition person. The Boys and Girls Clubs of Contra Costa is a, is a, a, a product of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Martinez merging with the Boys and Girls Clubs of El Sobrante. And so now the goal is to, you know, how do you, how do you take that organization and apply, right, our platform across Contra Costa County. And that's what I've been doing the last four months is really understanding the, the, the different communities that are in Contra Costa 
and you know the, the, the benefits of what we bring to the table. So it starts off when you look behind me, it's, it's and I was just in Atlanta at the Boys and Girls Clubs of America corporate office a couple of weeks ago, and we have what we call our Great Futures 2025 campaign. And that is a, a, a true focus on how to improve Right, all the services and, and all the resources and everything that we have in different ways to improve that. And I think it's great because it's, it, it's all about performance measurement, but it's also about a business acumen that you bring because you don't want to take funds and not use them you know, wisely, so to speak. Right? And so for me, one of the things that, that my team is getting, getting adjusted to is my focus on doing what we say we're going to do, Right, uh, for measuring performance of the executive staff to make sure that they're not just taking a paycheck, right? And I understand that we have people in our organization with good hearts, but I need them to also have good minds and good skills and good abilities because ultimately, everything our executive staff does, it impacts that young person, right? And so our goal, the Boys and Girls Clubs have what they have called a formula for impact. And what the formula for impact says is that we take the youth who need us the most and we put them in an environment that is an outcome driven, right? An outcome driven environment. So you're basically saying take those youth and basically take them off the streets, right? Put them in a structured environment where we measure attendance, right? Where we put them in programs that have, you know, results. And then if we do our jobs right, then we are going to produce a young person who is a good citizen, who is good in academics, and who lives an overall good lifestyle. And for me, that's called measurements, right? That's called measurements. And so what I'm training our staff to do is, it's great that we have, again, good hearts, but I want to be able to understand the young people who come through our programs, I want to measure what is their academic success rate in high school or in middle school. I want to measure what happens to them three years down the road, five years down the road, because to me, it means nothing if you have youth services programs, but you don't know the ultimate impact of your services to that person down the road, right? And that's an important measurement because you wanna be able to look back and say, okay, I see a red flag here because the youth that are coming through our program, they're not graduating at that high rate that you would think. And so for us, it would be important to now go back to understand is there something in our process that's, uh, that's not working? So when you look at and I'm just some examples of a couple of programs. A lot of times when people think of, they think of the Boys and Girls Club, they think of shooting pool and playing foosball or kickball or just, you know, really just coming recreational. But they're really structured programs such as triple play that focuses on overall healthy lifestyles, overall being able to, you know, look and see, you know, eating healthy, living healthy, what we kind of call mind, body, and soul. Then we have, for example, and these are just some examples, do-it-yourself STEM programs, right? Which are programs that are focused in science, technology, engineering, and math. And there are programs where we actually have a person, a site director teach, or a program director teach programs that have outcomes that we can measure, right? But we want them to have fun with it, right? We want to have fun with it, but it's still <coughs> focused on those core concepts of science, technology, engineering, and math. Then we have, one that we call, uh, it, it's sort of cyber survivor, right? Teaching young people now how to survive online, right? How to deal with online bullying, right? Just different things that, that young people go through, go through now. Smart moves, teaching young people how to make smart decisions when it comes to drugs and alcohol, right? Because we all know that those are things that our young people are exposed to. And then something like money matters. And again, these are just, you know, five, you know, five or six examples out of you know, 30, 40 different programs that are in the Rolodex of, of Boys and Girls Club of America. I think Money Matters is big because it teaches our young people the importance of checking accounts and savings accounts and, and interest rates. I always tell, you know, young people, you know, we talk to them about home ownership, right? And a lot of things that sometimes they're, 
you know, they don't, they don't think about, right? They don't think about, and so that's our, you know, an important program. So it's not just pool and, 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 and foosball. And for me, when you get it, when you get an opportunity and you go into a, 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 a club, and again, this is kind of just talking about, I always kind of say life outside of the community. I used to say life outside of Antioch. I'm telling our fundraisers and different people who give us money, I want to take our young people on field trip. I want them to go to the Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco because I want them to see the architecture. I want them to see the construction management. I want them to see the building design because we have young people who may want to go into those kind of trades, right? I want our people to get a chance to go see the Twitter headquarters, right? So if I'm up here in Antioch, I want to take youth from Antioch down to see the Twitter headquarters at 10th and Market Street so that they can understand that a tweet is much more than something you just do on the phone. That is an actual business behind that, right? So they can understand that. I want them to get a chance to go see Facebook, right? Get a chance to go see Google because I want our young people to understand that that's much more than a brand or a name that they see on the internet, right? I want them to understand that that's an actual career path that they can take. And for me, again, being sort of the, being sort of the, 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 the new guy and having the, the vision and the different things that you know, we talk about and we look at is you know, it's, it, it's about measuring. It's about doing what we say that we're going to do. Right? And so everything that I, that I showed and I talked about in terms of the programs, it is putting it in a, in a systematic way, right? a systematic approach, so that when we say we want to produce a young person, right? a young person who, when I saw, we say in Contra Costa, a young person who is a college graduate, right? a young person who is a successful business person, right? young people who are leaders in our community, and you know, young people who, at the end of the day, just have an extreme, you know, confidence in their ability to, you know, to move forward. So for me, this is, you know, this is huge. And again, because I've moved around quite a bit, I've seen similarities in small towns and different communities. You know, when you have that underserved person, they all go through the same thing. I don't care if it's Antioch, if it's Goldsboro, Goldsboro, North Carolina, if it's Sumter, South Carolina, you know, that young person who is in need of, of, of services and kind of in need of being, you know, in a program that offers hope, right? And, 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 and not hope, and gotta understand this, to me, hope is not, you know, it's not something that you just instill in a person mentally, right? And you just instill in their mindset to have dreams. Hope is when you show them specific actions that you're taking that directly contributes to their ultimate ability to go out and be successful, right? So when a young person sees actual activities that they can be a part of, that creates that hope of saying, I now have the skill sets that is required for me to go out and be successful. So that's my vision for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Contra Costa. And, and again, I've, I've had a lot of people talk about, they said, Mike, you have to get up to Antioch. You have to make it up to Antioch. And I got a chance to come up and, and see Mr. Lamar Thorpe here. And you know, he took me to the golf course and we, you know, we had lunch. And then we just drove around Antioch for about two hours, right? And just going through all the communities. And we were driving through, I said, I see it. I see it, I get it. And, it, and it's fun because you can see the opportunity Right to, to to you know to, to impact these young people right who don't even you know don't even realize sometimes the world is out there waiting for them. So that's the Boys and Girls Clubs of Contra Costa. That's my vision, and I'm having fun doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, from there, we'll go to uh, Nancy Kaiser, and just so that they'll give their presentations, and then we'll ask questions. And. If there's time, we'll, we'll, if you guys have questions, we're more than more than happy to have you ask oh, them. Are you recording this live? Or? Yes, it's live. Is there a page that I can go to? It, it's uh, it's on my Facebook, Lamar Thorpe, okay. City okay. Okay. Council Member Lamar Thorpe, and so it should be easy to find. And if you didn't get an agenda, they're on the table over there, so you can follow along. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Thorpe. Said I'm Nancy Kaiser, and I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the Parks and Recreation Department here 
director for the uh, city of Antioch. And uh, this community center that you're in is actually one of seven facilities and more than 30 parks and trails that make up the Antioch Parks and Recreation system. And residents can enjoy neighborhood parks, trails, community features from the river to the hills. So we're a very unique community that we've got all of these attributes and these natural features just right here for everybody to access. But when you think about it, um, today's middle school child has a very different experience with community than just their great grandparent. It's only taken four generations for an individual to change the way they're involved in community and the way they're involved with our land. If you think of that middle school child and you go back to their great grandparent, their great grandparents likely walked everywhere. They didn't have a car. They probably grew their food. They didn't have a grocery store right next door. They um, relied on their neighbors and their friends and their family for services and connection and social and emergency services. Uh, and that's just the way community was four generations ago. Fast forward to today, and that middle school child is most likely driven everywhere. Um, you know, as was mentioned, they don't know what's maybe outside of their, their, their world. Uh, believe it or not, many middle school kids don't understand that milk in the grocery store actually comes from a cow on a ranch or a farm somewhere versus a plastic or cardboard carton in the grocery store. So it's a very different relationship that we have here in the community with our youth and our families. But we are fortunate here in um, Antioch to have access to, like I said, more than 30 parks, all these features and facilities, and regional parks. We have a partnership with East Bay Regional Park District right here in Antioch. Black Diamond Mines is at the southern end of Summersville Road. It's just a quick, quick uh, reach up there, and it is more than 6,000 acres. It's one of the largest parks in the East Bay Regional Park District um, system. It's larger than Tilden Park. Everyone talks about Tilden Park. It's iconic. It's certainly one of the founding parks of East Bay Regional Park District. But the fact is that out here in Antioch, we have more open space and land to access. Um, so we actually are the luckier citizens in uh, working with this regional agency and providing all of this open space. Hikers can get all the way to Clayton and to Mount Diablo, starting right here in Antioch. That's really something to be proud of and to uh, share with everyone else. We are reaching a population of 115,000 people. We are and we will remain the second largest city in Contra Costa County behind Concord. But we are one of the oldest cities in California and we're actually the oldest incorporated city in Contra Costa County. We, um, the, the county is a public entity uh, incorporated in 1850, but Martinez didn't have a large enough population until 1876 to become a city. So we are the oldest and we have quite a bit of legacy here in, uh, uh, in the region to be proud of, actually. Come on in, welcome. So continuing on a little bit about Antioch, we have the highest percentage of population of uh, under 18 here in Contra Costa County. We are a fairly young community, but as I mentioned, we also have a high number of um, longtime legacy residents because we are one of the oldest cities around. People over 85 have lived here their entire lives. Citizens of all ages volunteer in many programs and projects. They share stories, they preserve history, and they do so much more. They sponsor activities, they're engaged in the community because of that legacy, because of that rich history they have with their community, and they'd like to see that carry forward, uh, especially connecting with all the new families and the new residents that are coming out here and, and joining us, because we know what we have here is special, and they want that too. And we celebrate our diversity every day. Our ethnic variety creates a cohesive whole here in Antioch. Our Caucasian, Latino, Black, and Asian populations are not quite equal in numbers, but we're getting there. And that's a very unique aspect of Antioch uh, and this region. We should be really um, happy and again celebrate that diversity because it does make that collective and cohesive whole. So across the country, nine out of 10 recreation and park agencies provide out of school time programming. And Antioch is no different. We're right there in with that um, statistic. We have a variety of programs throughout the year and in the summer, and we ensure that access is available for our children and our families. Doesn't mean that we have to have equality throughout the city, but we look at creative ways, and we're always brainstorming from staff to city council on ways to bring access and to make sure that there's some sort of connectivity for our youth and our families. 84% of local park and recreation agencies offer summer camps. Antioch does too. We will offer more than 15 summer camps this uh, summer for school-age kids, and more than 15 summer camps or academies for preschoolers 
preparing to enter school. It's pretty scary when you start that kindergarten first day. Uh, so we uh, play our part in helping families and that age group bridge and transition their role in community and as they grow and become um, aware of the bigger community. Nearly two-thirds of agencies across the country offer programming targeted specifically to teens. And Antioch offers a variety of programs um, from open gym time to specialty classes. Uh, we also have the Antioch Council of Teens, which is an engagement opportunity for middle school and high schoolers to be connected to the community. It's not a commission. It's not a formal body of the city of Antioch. Um, we made the decision to make it a little bit more informal so it can uh, be organic and it can respond to the trends of teens, it can respond to the interests of teens, and we're not dictating what they should do throughout the year. Uh, really, the teens make the decision about what they want to do from community service to programming. And I'm actually very proud to report that our Antioch Council of Teens is mostly involved in engagement in community. Sure, they like to do programs. Sure, they get excited about having pizza once a month, because let's face it, it's all about the food, right? <laughs> when you're 14 to 16 years old. Um, but you can uh, be rest assured that they care about the community and they focus on ways that they can serve and give back. Uh, they uh, responded to more than 85 letters to Santa this holiday. We have a little mailbox in the lobby here for a short time period. Um, we do promotions and focus on, on our preschoolers and our families and children. Uh, we actually have families come running in. I have, to, I have to drop my son's letter off and put it in the mailbox for Santa. I'm running out of time. I promised him I'd do it. And those teens sat down and responded to every single letter and got it in the mail in time so that that youngster would receive it, you know, a letter from Santa back. So those are the things that our teens are involved in. Um, Antioch childhood obesity rates are alarming. Dr. Cindy Cho from the Contra Costa County Health Department conducted a study in 2017 and discovered that Antioch neighborhoods where the obesity rate has reached 50%, it wasn't just one neighborhood, it was about five different neighborhoods. She also went further and looked at the relationship between those neighborhoods, those kids and families, to parks. And surprisingly, that 50% obesity rate does involve neighborhoods that have access to a neighborhood park. They're close by. But again, that goes back to what I said earlier about the way families and generations today are connected to their community. They're using the land differently. They, you know, it's a different social environment. They move around the community and they just don't play at the park all day long in out of school or out of required time. It's a completely different community. But today, I mean, everyone says it's related to thumbs doing this on the computer screen. That's certainly a contributing factor, but it is something that's been growing for more than one generation. Uh, and we, uh, you know, we're one of the cities that has this high, high childhood obesity rate in some key, key pockets. So we continue to work with the county to explore ways to engage those families in our parks and programs because um, we also contribute to ha active living, um, healthy living, and an active environment. That's a role that a recreation program and parks department has in the community. So we wanna do our part in these partnerships to get people more active, get them healthy, uh, and there are proven statistics to show that what that can do for quality of life. We have classes, we have camps, we have clinics, I mean, everything that I've mentioned uh, before. So I've talked about access. We are committed to providing access for children and families, which is accomplished through a variety of approaches. We offer scholarships for youth, and that's funded by multiple partners. Uh, the City of Antioch, through our Community Development Block Grant Program, uh, provides those funds. Uh, the General Fund has contributed to that scholarship program throughout the year, and our new Antioch Community Foundation is committed funds to when we need it for scholarships. We are actually in conversation with the county about scholarships for adults uh, that uh, have a, an income and a health challenge to be able to participate in programs. Again, going back to active living, that is a, um, something that we are a big partner of in this community. We offer a mobile recreation camp experience uh, in three of our parks in the north part of this community. And again, that provides access uh, to families that perhaps uh, can't afford a camp, uh, perhaps can't travel around the community. Uh, and again, to show you how we grow and establish those programs, it started out with grant funds at 100%, and we're slowly weaning off of those grant funds as we figure out ways to incorporate it into our base budget. Um, but that is um, a very popular program, and folks talk to us about, well, we need to provide these programs because it's in our lower income communities. That may have a ring of truth, but the fact of the matter is it's also um, the area of our community that has a much higher density 
than this part of the community. So it's not a matter of wealth or education, but when you have just a higher density, um, we have just a higher percentage of those other social factors that um, come into play. Uh, for example, we've been looking at our um, uh, neighborhoods uh, for opportunities, and uh, what everyone commonly refers to as the Sycamore neighborhood, down in Sycamore, Mahogany, and Encinita Way, we have over 8,000 residents in a one mile diameter um, circle. That's pretty high density. Uh, and that's not something that we have today. The city created that high density back in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, we just have a continued uh, role in making sure that that high density neighborhood has a quality of life because they're an integral part of our community. A lot of hardworking families in that neighborhood and they just have different challenges to access. So by going to where our residents live, we're making sure that we have that access. We partner in um, a lot of programs. We partner in the Giants, uh, Junior Giants program in the summer. We partner with um, PAL, East Bay Regional Parks, First Five. You know, we don't go it alone. We look at our resources in the community and we have a lot of conversations. Uh, with me today is Julie Martin, our Recreation Specialist for Community Recreation Services. And a big part of her job is just having conference calls and communication with a lot of um, partner um, opportunities out there how we can grow those, how we can develop them, so that it's win-win. We have um, a lot of uh, low or no cost programs from uh, family campfires. And you're like, family campfires, is that an East Bay Regional Park thing? You do that at big parks? Nope, we have them right here in our amphitheater. And anywhere from 85 to 185 uh, folks come out a couple of times a summer and we have the tiniest campfire ever. But you'd be surprised how many families and children have never had a s'more before. And that, uh, that experience, you don't have to go camping, you don't have to go far away to have that experience. We can create it right here in Antioch. And it's, uh, it's really a lot of fun on a summer evening. Um, we've done um, rock painting and we will continue to provide rock painting experience. And that's a very therapeutic art, nature, social activity. Again, uh, low cost, no cost, just a, an opportunity for youth and family to be engaged with each other. Talk, enjoy, relax. And, and have a wonderful afternoon. When we talk about access, we've been uh, very creative over the last few years on how we can provide that access. Last year we introduced a one day 15% discount on all classes and program registration. So popular, we were very um, pleased with the results of that. We are offering it again. I think it's becoming um, sort of part of our base programs. It's May 11th this year. And again, that is a big recreation and health expo. It's an opportunity for us to share with the community what we do and in community. We're partnering this year with um, Antioch Unified School District. Uh, they would like to get their families out and they would like to get their families experience with um, health services and recreation activities, again, out of school time. There's such a big school family there, but what happens when that school family is done at the end of the day? We're trying to engage our uh, families in helping them learn and understand what's available in out of school time. And that expo is the perfect way. And with a one day 15% discount on all programs and classes, a family that may be wanting to have their child in two summer camps but can't afford it, now can sign their child up for those two classes or camps because of that one day discount. Uh, let's see. We've had the great fortune of having um, some one-time revenues infused to our system. Thank you, City Council, um, for uh, this year only. And with a little bit of creativity, we're utilizing those funds um, wisely to roll out a few new ventures focused on access. Some will be um, sustainable, but we're, some, so we're gonna be continuing to look at some pilot programs to provide baseline data. Um, and let me just give you a few examples of what exactly we're doing there. Tri-Delta Transit uh, uh, has a youth summer bus program and it's a pass for $50. And for the summer, youth can go anywhere. Um, in that system and the city is partnering with that to allow Antioch youth to purchase that pass for um, just $25. Uh, we are creating a mobile uh, recreation van that again will travel to parks and activate those parks. We are um, scheduling Friday family night movies this summer. We have four of them scheduled in our parks. We had big truck day last October which was free and was super successful and everybody would like us to do it again. Uh, and we have water park events uh, throughout the summer as well. Uh, we track um, trends and interests through surveys with our customers and questions and answers with our customers uh, to get information on what they would like to see here in our community. 
And our mission statement is to unify and strengthen the community by creating quality experiences that inspires lifelong learning. So we are a primary gateway and platform for residents and families to be connected to the community. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dani Imai. Since Daniela, I go by Dani. Uh, way too many vowels. Um, I'm the coordinator of, for educational, one of the coordinators for educational services in Antioch Unified School District. And for the past almost seven years, I've been primarily focused on library services and out of school times programs for kids. Um, I've been playing around in public education for 36 years. Um, never had the same job for more than seven. This is my longest stint in any one job description. <laughs> and that has, uh, and I've educated or taught and worked in education systems in Illinois, Utah, and California. And uh, just like Mike said, we see the same trends and we see the same needs regardless of state. I've also lived in different countries. We see the same thing everywhere underserved youth, disengaged, not learning, lost their home. I drive around Antioch and I see young men standing at the corner and going, you wanted to be an astronaut, you wanted to be somebody famous, you wanted to do great things, you wanted to, you know, for the girls be a ballerina, every five-year-old girl wants to be a ballerina, well, not every, but you know. <laughs> what happened to your dreams, what happened to your hopes? Breaks my heart. And so um, when I was asked to take care of out-of-school time programming, that just really was kind of a gift. <laughs> Problem is, we're a school district. We're supposed to focus on 7.30 to 3 o'clock. That's our main priority, the academics. And so um, that has kind of run over into the after-school programs too. And these guys are a tough act to follow, let me tell you. I'm, I'm used to teaching mostly middle school, so I'm going very step by step and my uh, PowerPoint is exactly that. Let's see, why is it not working? We may have to go, there we go, wrong key. So uh, my focus has been on three sets of programs. Um, ACES is our K-8 program. It is funded through a grant from the state based on your tax dollars, Prop 49, which was passed back in 2002. And it takes care of kids no nominally kindergarten through eighth grade but kindergartners don't last from 7.30 till six o'clock at night, okay? So the other program we have is assets, that's for the high schoolers. You can see it's federally funded. And then, as you said, learning to take these grant monies and use them as seed money and finding ways to make the program sustainable, diving into the base services budget. Well, we're not in the base yet, but we're looking at what's called supplemental and concentration funding in our funding formula for schools. Some of those monies are being used to supplement out of school time activities for our school kids. So under LCAP, Local Control Accountability Program. Sorry, I swim in educational lease alphabet soup. Um, so the Local Control Accountability Pro, um, Plan is mandated because the state changed the way they fund schools. It's kind of a block grant. Here's this much money and you get a base amount for every kid that if that student has special needs, and I don't mean special needs as in special education, if that student is an English learner, if that student is socioeconomically disadvantaged, et cetera, et cetera, you get a little bit of extra. And if that student falls into more than one category and tends to be missing school a whole lot, you get a little extra money for that. But you have to spend those extra funds on services and programs to address the needs of those kids. So that was helpful, except you reach your maximum input at some point. Sorry, that's my phone going off. School's in session. Um, <laughs> um, so you reach a point where you have to start looking, no, we can't just keep using extra money for this. This has to become part of what we do. As a school district, how much, of what, how much can you do out of school time? And we'll talk about partnerships and things like that in a minute. So um, I'm not gonna read that to you, you can read for yourselves. The thing with the LCAP funded programs, that we um, allocated funds to schools and they ask the principals, look at your kids, what do they need? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is homework help, tutoring, <laughs> things like that. So they instituted those programs. What was missing was more of the social, uh, the, um, social emotional supports. Some schools are digging into that but that's a whole other avenue that's 
not necessarily our forte. We do academics. <laughs> you know, we try to raise and educate the whole child, but we're still learning a lot about the rest of the child. Uh, ACEs and assets are different in that way. ACEs mandate is to educate the whole child with a focus on social emotional supports, not on academics. This isn't homework club, this isn't daycare. This is a place where kids can go and learn to how to interact with each other, how to settle conflicts, how to get their homework done, manage time, eat well, get some exercise and things like that. Uh, assets is slightly different. Um, ACEs were kind of on a, as long as we do what we have to do, we keep getting our money, but it changes. And we keep getting less because we're a shrinking district. So it's based on student funding. Assets, you have to apply every five years, and it's nationally competitive. Antioch is in its third round of assets funding, which is really quite an accomplishment. That means we're doing things right, but we're not maybe doing things perfectly. Um, ACES, because of the limited funding, is in two, six elementary and two middle schools. It is a mandated program. Just like you said, we track attendance. It's great to have a program, but if you're not there as a child, you can't succeed in a program. So it's expected that the kids are there every day from last bell until six o'clock. We feed them snacks, we feed them supper, we help with homework, and we do stuff. We use a lot of paper clips, copper wire batteries, self and do-it-yourself STEM programs, you know, pizza cartons turn into what we call automata, cranking Ferris wheels and stuff like that. We do music, we do a lot of youth voice and leadership. Uh, having kids tell us what they want to do. As you can see, at 60 kids per school site, that is a minuscule portion of our students, but that's what we have funding for. Okay? And we're doing the very best we can. We have a great partner. Um, talk about that in a minute. Assets is different. Assets is at the high school right now. It's only at Antioch High, um, and it's based on drop-in activities. Being the school-based thing, and one of the mandates for assets is that we have to have an impact on students' academic achievement. So credit recovery is huge. Kids who are failing classes or who have failed classes can attend in the afternoons, and with tutoring support and online software, they can make up those that algebra class that they got the F in or the biology course or the English course. Homework help is available every day. We have Fit Club open every day where kids go for fitness routines and weight training, and then we have a bunch of what they call clubs or activities um, everything from Pacific Islanders to the Care Club, which one and, and the cross country runners phased into our after school program when they started running with the dogs from the shelter. Um, panther tails, you know, things like that. So, trying to get the kids involved in community service as well as improving their own attendance, achievement, and attitude. It's the triple A home run. Attitude, achievement, and attendance is what we're all about. <laughs> Correlations to um, impact on the community. My idea is if the kids in the program, they're not hanging out at Joe's Liquor, okay? They're not hanging out at the street corner inhaling toxic substances or anything like that. They're not finding ways to get each other in trouble. They'll try that in the program too, but you know, at least it's in a controlled setting. Uh, kids are kids. Their job is to push the edges of the envelope. Our job is to <laughs> teach them where to stop, okay? <laughs> So um, the program, since they are grant funded and LCAP funded, there's a high accountability. We have to measure. We are given outcomes. You have to have so much attendance every day. You have to have a measurable impact on academic achievement, which is measured in with better grades and things like that. So every year, we have to have an outside evaluator give us report cards, and they're available on our website. <laughs> it tells us that um, kids who attend in K-8, more than 45 days and in the high school more than 30 days, if they come to the programs frequently enough, they do have an impact. Better school day attendance, up to 17%, up to 17 days more. And 17 days of school that you didn't have, that's a lot, okay? So kids on average in the K-8, they attend 17 days more than kids who don't go to after school. Um, in assets, it's a little bit more weekly because it's kid driven and they come and go as they wish. They do come back, come out better in math and English because probably because they get homework help or credit recovery, and that has an impact on graduation rate at our high schools. More kids are graduating. 
with standards-based assessments, not because they brought in a box of Kleenex and got extra credit, okay? <laughs> um, so those are the things, those are the impacts it has on our community. We do have some partnerships, but we're our own best partner at this point. We get to use the facilities for free. Yes, we have to pay the custodians a little extra, but you know, we don't have to pay for renting the weight room or for using the multi-purpose room or the classrooms and the portables every day. So AUSD supports the after-school programs that way. Nutrition services from a grant through the agriculture department feeds our kids twice a day, snacks right after school and supper before they go home. It may not be a five-day, five a five-course meal, but it's food and the kids mostly like it, unless it's burritos, they get all tired of those. Um, and AUSD has used some funding from the LCAP, from their local control funding formula, from their block grant to supplement the program so we can keep them up. Because there's less money coming down from the state, less money coming down from the feds, but the need is increasing. Our community is changing. There are more and more underserved youth. And so we need to keep it up, and Antioch, has started, Antioch Unified School District has put some money into it in addition to the programs that we funded at the sites. We've partnered with the Bay Area Community Resources, uh, Contrabus is a lot of food bank, um, and other contracted vendors. We're looking for community partners. There are, all, there are short term um, efforts and short term partnerships, except for Mike's Pastry, give a hood to them. They have provided pastries for our monthly food drive over at Antioch High School every year for the last six years. Um, a, com a contractor in the community has provided base primer and technical advice for painting the, the utility boxes, art on the box, was a project that our kids started getting into. So there are these lots of community partners, they're short term, they're limited, because we can't expect the community to start paying for every kid in the community, but we need to start looking at how can the community support every kid in the community. So I'm looking forward to talking to these two people a little bit more. Um, we have summer programs, but they are focused on academic intervention. We're a school district, you know. We would love to do camps and we try to do some field trips, but most of our summer programs are focused on helping kids who are behind grade level achievement, whether it's math, reading, English language development. We do some preparation programs like math readiness for kids going from fifth grade into middle school and from middle school into high school. Um, and uh, the African American Male Preparatory Academy is specifically designed for eighth grade boys moving into a high school environment, self-esteem, that kind of stuff. And they, they take field trips to colleges and helping kids understand there's more than what you see right in front of your face. Um, we are currently redesigning it to be more of a, instead of more so intervention focused, there will be intervention, but we're trying to put it into a longer program. Instead of three hours of reading, you'll have six hours, you'll do some STEM stuff, you'll do some project-based learning, you'll do some targeted intervention, and yes, you will use the reading software to assess your progress, but then you go back and you build something with your friends in your classroom, collaborative uh, experiential learning thing. And we're designing that, and we're gonna look and see how that impacts our kids in the future. Uh, one of the things that Michael brought up, I'm gonna skip this one, uh, one of the things that Michael brought up was um, not only the hope, but also the long-term follow-up. How do we know that, okay, this kid attended the reading intervention program in third grade, three years later, is that kid's kid still reading at grade level, or has he or she lost the progress? This student went through the AMPA program just to prepare themselves for high school and peer impact. Did they follow through? Did they come out ahead? And so on and so on. So we're setting up systems and structures for long-term measurements so that we can prove that our investments and the state and federal investments in our youth are really paying off. I'm on the website, lots of stuff on the website if you have questions, um, and I do have some handouts that we're working with, like the LCAP in one page, and the skills that we're working on, the 21st century skills that guide our programs at all levels. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> And, and so just so folks understand, so we're getting an overview, as it says in, on, the, on, uh, on our agenda, it's just an overview of what possibilities exist, what currently exists. Uh, and then from there, we'll go into panels that specifically start looking at needs. Uh, some of that exploratory work is, is empirical. It's not necessarily based on any data. We want to talk to our school 
principals and whatnot and faith leaders as to what they see in the community so that we can then uh, take that information and kind of try to get data around that. Uh, so uh, this was a good overview. Uh, so we're gonna um, open it up to, uh, to question and answers. And uh, did you wanna start? Yeah, I can start. yeah. Uh, and I'll just go in order. Michael, thank you for your presentation. What does it take for a community like ours to get Boys and Girls Club to come out to Antioch? So, um. <clears throat> well, first, I think it starts with understanding the need and then understanding where the community would want the Boys and Girls Club set up. And what I mean by that is we have currently have four different sites, and we are in Pinol, we are in El Sobrante, we are in Martinez, and we are in. Um, What did I tell you? Pinola, Martinez, El Sobrante, and uh, San Pablo. Damn, and the reason why I forgot about San Pablo is because San Pablo is an ACES site. So it's an ACES site in a school. So when I, when I go through that sort of scenario of where do we have our sites, I always know the physical individual brick and mortar sites, but the school sites are, again, it's ACES run, so it's, it's Boys and Girls Club inside of a school, which is, which is different. Right? It, it, it's different, and the reason why I think that's different is because, again, you may have a community that says, you know what, we want the Boys and Girls Club, but we want to, to be part of the Antioch Unified School District ACES program. That's different. Versus if you come and say, you know what, we want the Boys and Girls Club, but we want you to team up with the community center, right, and bring your programs there. Or we want the Boys and Girls Club, and we are going to connect to a different building, standalone building, brick and mortar, and its own individual site. And each approach has a different relationship, right? But I think the core sort of fundamentals is the Boys and Girls Club programs that, that, that comes with that. Uh, but it is a, a, a different approach. So I think it's the, it's the city and the community saying, we wanna bring the Boys and Girls Club, or we're interested in bringing the Boys and Girls Clubs here, but we see the, the, the most value of doing it this way. And those are three unique ways. And then it's up for all of us to get together and talk about you know, what, what, what makes the most sense. I'll say for me, the, the ACES program, and again, the reason why I kind of forgot it, it's not the highest on my, on, my, on my sort of list there because it's almost school after school. Right, because our youth in San Pablo in, in Helms Middle School, when they leave the classroom at 3.30 or 2.30 when they say they're going to the Boys and Girls Club, they go down the hall. And then they go into another room. And now they're in the Boys and Girls Club program. But they never got a chance to leave Campus. that facility, right? Versus when they leave school and they say, hey, I'm going to the Boys and Girls Club. I'm going three blocks down the road, right, to a different facility. When I walk in there, it's Boys and Girls Club. So I think you gotta have those kind of conversations and really kind of think that youth in. Uh, and then the kind of the final piece of that, that question is that we have a lot of funders, right? We have a lot of grant opportunities that right now are looking at specific communities. And that's when I said when I first sort of opened up there, I've had people come up to me and said, we want to see services in Antioch. And I tell you, the, the, the big ones that are saying that, John Muir Health is saying that, uh, a group called the Lesser Foundation is saying that. And, and so, you know, I was like, wow, let me get up here to Antioch, right? <laughs> see, what, see what's happening, because that, that conversation keeps, uh, you know, keeps coming up. Right. So now, you know, it, 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 I think the next level of conversation is, okay, if there's a need and, and there's some interest in having the because again, Boys and Girls Club is a national brand, right? So it's bringing that national branding, that national programming, sort of that you know behavioral science behind you know learning, you know. But what method do you implement becomes sort of a, a, the other second half of the conversation. Good. Thank you. No, and I've talked to Lesher and John Muir and yelled at them for not getting enough of their money out this direction. <laughs> well, there so, you go. That's. Uh, I mean, that's this is this is good to hear. Um, so funding, how much funding are we talking about? Oh, that depends on the youth, our average daily attendance, you know, the type of youth that, or, or the quantity of youth in terms of, 
Is it 100 youth we're, we're trying to serve? That's a certain facility, that's a certain amount of program, that's a certain amount of staffing. You know, is that number going to be more in the 50, you know, 40, 50 range? So I think it, it really is determined on, you know, some of it may be where the location ends up versus where some of the schools are at may have to have a transportation piece to it, right? So I think there's an entire analysis and assessment to really under, you know, understand because again, my, my, my big thing at the end of the day is how is that youth ultimately impacted, right? All this other stuff, right? All those measurements, all, you know, you gotta get the, the most out of that so ultimately that, that youth is impacted. So you may have youth that have a really need but they were set up over here and we owe them that transportation piece. So I think you gotta answer, assess that entire piece and then understand the different sort of value streams that each one, each one has and the cost associated with it. Right. Yeah, so, um, so my questions are for uh, all of you. And, and I think they're pretty basic, so I don't think they need. So what is your operating budget? Current total operating Current budget? Total about operating a million and a half. A million and a half. And how much staff do you have? Us total? Man, you had some hard questions. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, it's about numbers and cents. And so when we go we back to- We have four site directors, we have four administrative staff, and we have about 12 spread throughout the, uh, spread throughout the sites. A couple of sites, uh, Martinez and our San Pablo Hemp uh, ACES site is staffed with five program people each. And then the other sites are staffed with three. And what that means is that you have a site director who is responsible for that location, and then they have a staff of you know three to five people who are responsible for executing the programs that that, that you have up there. And, and and it's important to understand that the hierarchy is measuring the program specialist to make sure that they're executing the programs daily to the youth, and then it's measuring the site director to make sure that that site director is running that facility and getting the type of results that are expected. And then it's the administrative staff making sure that the overall, whether it's funding, whether it's the outcome driven results, that all of that is happening. So, and then you have various in, you know, intervals of training and so forth that comes in that uh, actually assist that staffing. So it's a, it's a, it's a training piece of it right. as well. But, Hope and answer your question, that did, over. and um, uh, the four site directors, one is at a school and then the rest are at facilities? Correct. And so the three facilities, do you own the facilities? Uh, one we do, yeah. Okay. One we do, the other one is, well I should say two because the other one is a unit that is on the school, right? It's like a modular unit and what happens there is the modular unit becomes sort of the base of you know, certain programming or certain administrative functions, and then we use the school's facilities okay. in there. It's, it's different from ACES because it's, we're part of the school, but we're not controlled by the ACES part of it. It's more or less the school saying, you know what, instead of the transportation piece, you guys can park you know, your home here and then use our facilities. And then the other two locations we rent. And the last question is, how many youth total do you serve? Uh, total about 350 a day. At all four locations? Correct. That's all in When you put them all together, yeah. So I'm gonna follow up with that. We serve about 500 kids a day in K-8, and a minimum of 108 at the high school, so that's 600, call it 600, 625 kids every day. Last bell till six o'clock, mandated. We use only school facilities at this point. The schools have set special rooms aside for the ACES program. Uh, operating budget, um, not counting the in-kinds that we get from our partners and our contractors, just cash on the barrel head, $925,000. And we serve all those kids because we can't afford to pay more than minimum wage for line staffers. <laughs> Line staffers are fully trained. They have to meet instructional aid requirements. So retention is an issue because the minute our, our people qualify and are you know certified to serve as program leads, uh, program staffers, not to mention the leads, we have a coordinator at each site. That coordinator is also responsible for 20 kids. 
has to be a 20 to 1 ratio. That's mandatory. So, so anyway, yeah. That, that, that's good. You said the high school, how many were in the high school? At least 108 a day is what we have to serve. 108 a day that you have to serve. What's the average attendance that you're seeing? Pardon? Because it's, that's, it, I mean, you're, you're inviting. Are you getting to the point where where 108 isn't enough and you have to, you're turning kids away or is there always room? Oh no, there's always room. There's always room. And what's the average attendance that you're um, seeing? Credit Recovery, for example, has at least 40 kids in it every day. Um, the Pacific Islander Club only meets once a week, but they got 50 kids in their classroom piling in. The uh, cross country team does their thing in the spring. Average, the minimum I have to have to be cost benefit ratio is 17 kids per hour per staff. So in- That's in the high school program. So in total, you're serving a little less than 600 kids. Yeah. And then my last question it's for you- my, <laughs> my last question for you, you said that we have, that your programs are at six elementary schools and two middle schools. How many schools does Antioch have in total? 24. 24 schools. We're serving nine. And serving nine. And then the schools that you're at, they're specifically Title IX, Title, Title I, Title I yeah. schools. And so I just want to point this out so that the audience understand is uh, Antioch is unique because we have two zip codes. And so people have a misunderstanding of what our community is. If you average the two zip codes, you get, an, you get a very low income. Uh, if you just look at our 945, 09 zip code, it's very, very low. It's like the, ad, the average income is like 31,000, or the medium household income is 31,000. If you just look at 94531, which is the zip code we're in now, it's one of the wealthiest zip codes in the county. And it's the wealthiest zip code second here in East County to Discovery Bay. So people in Brent would love to think that they're, they're not us. Uh, and so, so it creates a challenge. So everyone says, we need to go to Antioch, we need to go to Antioch, we need to serve the community but not all of our community has Title I schools because we have high income earning people in this community. Oh. And so the challenges you're talking about have to do with you know, low and reduced lunch, uh, people who qualify for low and reduced lunch uh, uh, programs. Yeah, we're funded on free and reduced lunch applications. We're not gonna get into community eligi eligibility right. provision. But um, what we've seen in the last seven years that I've been involved with out of school services, it doesn't matter so much anymore. The statistics may ascribe a higher income to five, nine, four, five, whatever, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. end right. of town, mm -hmm. but free and reduced lunch applications are averaging out across all schools. Acro across, right, and that's the same thing that I'm sure you're seeing at your school, which we'll hear about. Mm -hmm. And I you know I was talking to the principal of Lone Tree Elementary School. She said, while we're in this high income community, we pull, draw a lot of children from different parts of the community because, ch because their parents opt out of their local schools and they end up on this side of town. So we have a lot, that, so these challenges are, this is why this is important work. It's not just to say we need youth programs. It's really complex and it's not just about building something and hoping people come. People have different needs in our community. You know, so, real, real quick, I wanna, wanna explain on, just be on the ownership of the, of the building part because that can be a unique situation and I kind of misspoke a little bit. The city of Martinez, and, and I call that our site, but what it actually is, is the city of Martinez rent a parcel that they had to us for a dollar a month, right. and it's forever, right? But we're responsible for everything, right? From HVAC to the, I mean, anything to go, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's our building. But they set it up that way as a, I think, a way to say, you know what, we, we want those services here forever, Here's a parcel that, that that we have. We're not going to put money into it, and so it's my job to go out and get the funding and the support to right. you know keep that, that 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 building updated. And one of the things that is important on the ADA piece of that. So when you have that ADA, that average daily attendance, and when I walk into that building, the things that I look at is we have you know what you call a team center, right? And I'm telling all of our funders and all of the people that we interact with is, you know, I want a teen center where youth say, I can't wait to go to the Boys and Girls Club. Right. I don't want to go hang out on the street. I can't wait to go there. I'm working with the Golden State Warriors now to renovate our gym. And people think, well, why is the gym important? You know, I always use the term books and ball, right? Because if we get them in, 
with the ball, that gives us an opportunity to get them into the books, right? And so we're focused on renovating, you know, that gym. And so again, I, I want to create an environment where youth are saying it's exciting to, right. you know, to go there. Right. So that's a right. big right. piece of the Martinez part that I just wanted to point out. That parcel is a dollar rent for forever. Right. So you see how the three of us make up the three legs of the triangle. Right. And so, and Nancy, if you can <laughs> go back to my questions and if if you focus on that, and then if uh, the audience have any questions, we'll open it up to them. So we have we have school, we have community, and just so you know that and you know our focus is neighborhood. Going back to how we have families and kids connected to their neighborhood because that creates a better neighborhood right. that builds a stronger community, and that's where our parks are located. Here in Antioch, as you know, we have um, two different departments that provide these community services. Our park maintenance and trail landscape and median landscape is performed out of our public works department. And recreation programming and facility programming is in the recreation department. So we have two um, units providing the service in the community, so we work together. And what I'm gonna do is generally say that in public works, you know, that um, budget is, is well over a million dollars. You know, we can split hairs of maybe closer to two million, definitely more than a million. Here on the recreation and programming facility side of it, it's a three and a half million dollar budget. We receive approximately $1.3 million from the general fund. So the rest we raise um, through um, fees and other funding sources. So we, we're actually the, the best taxpayer investment the city has um, because we are recouping you know, two to one our, uh, our own budget on the recreation and programming side of it. So that just gives you a little bit about um, our funding um, perspective. Recreation and park departments of our size across the country average about 90 FTE. Here in recreation, that's total, 90 total. So FTE. can I just, are you differentiating youth? Because we, we, we want to know about youth. Right, so just this quick statistic. When I say 90 FTE, that's a parks and recreation department. In parks, we contract out the services. In recreation, we have 10 regular full-time employees. Our total FTE is about 23. When you kind of combine our full-time regular and our temp hours, it's about 23 FTE. So you can see compared to cities our size, we are a completely different staffing structure. So we have to get very creative and um, rely on partnerships. But our role out there in the community, again, is to engage youth in neighborhood, in community, and we are doing that through our programs and our forecasting with these trends and futures on how to engage youth and kids in their neighborhoods, in the parks. So getting them as excited to come to their parks as they are to you know, stay after school or to go to a, a partner um, to participate in programs. We have some centralized opportunities to do that. So because we have our standalone gym, open gym, during the summer, especially for middle schools, it's very, very popular. Anywhere from three kids on a summer day to 35 kids on a summer day here in the gym in the afternoons, hanging out, playing games, doing basketball, um, so that's very popular. Um, we are also um, introducing some youth leadership camps this summer for that middle school set. Okay, so, okay I, so I'm, I'm gonna, only because you know, time, but I'd really like to, so you're, you have talked about 15 summer, I wanna talk about what's happening now, not what we're gonna get into and in what's gonna happen in the future. You had talked about 15 summer camps, we are offering and then awards. 15 preschool summer camps. So in this, 15 summer camps, uh, what is the total number of people we're serving, youth, and then, as well as in the preschool camps, and then how much does it cost our city to operate those 15 programs, or is this all cost recovery? Um, so, it's not all cost recovery. Our new fee and pricing policy outlines a real um, nice graduated hierarchy of identifying programs and their benefits to the community, and that establishes the base of no cost, low cost, or a complete cost recovery, and that's based on benefit to the community versus benefit to the individual. Right, right. So our summer our programs for youth, about 80% have been um, landing in that no cost to low cost program, and some of them um, more cost recovery than others. So department-wise, we touch more than 200,000 people annually. So I'm talking youth to seniors. We, um, we serve all of our uh, families and residents here. Our youth programs all have different outcomes and goals. Some youth programs may have only six to 10 youngsters in them because of the type of program that it is. 
So a youth dance program that's a very individual experience, that's a, a mentorship program, that's a skill building program, that's got a lower ratio versus summer camps, we could have up to 45 kids in one individual camp program. So for us, it depends on outcomes, but as a department, we are touching over 200,000 touches per year. So. Right, but some of those are duplicated and whatnot. So I wanna get back to the 15 summer program. So you're serving up to 45 children Per, per camp, per, per and camp. Some, some more, some less. Again, some like more, junior some. lifeguards, you don't want 45 kids in that program because it's um, a unique experience. But the cap is 45. Correct. And then it, I'm assuming that some of these are duplicated numbers uh, in that the summer program is a week, and then that parent then comes back and re-enrolls that student for the... Uh, for, I, I'm saying that because I did that, so I'm assuming that... that may be the case for other people so yes. with yeah. the same. so they're multi-touches and then the preschool program how many do we serve there um, our preschool program is limited to 20 is that our maximum and 18 but because we have additional staff that we can tour we can go up to 22 up to 22 um, and our preschool program our year-round preschool program is at capacity so when we talk oh. about being a young community we have waiting lists for that program so this preschool program that you talked to that's not a that's a year-round program yes um, okay. in this summer we're offering new like I said preschool camps and academies especially for that four or five age group to bridge from staying home or being in a, in a short program to school so now remind me of the price of the, what the price range is for the for the 15 programs that you run in the summer that over to Julie because she's been working on those in detail. Um, it ranges between 200 and $300 for either if it's a session of preschool because they don't all meet every day. Um, so that's kind of the price point for that. Um, as far as one week of camp goes, that's around the 200 to 25 range. 225 a week. Correct. So with regulations and guidelines, we do have oversight on the number of um, camp leaders and mentors right. supervising children, so it's a pretty high staff component, which the school district is very familiar with. Is the camp programs, uh, the summer camp programs, are they cost re are they fully cost recovery? They are not. They are not. So where would you put that low? Or uh, it falls in the uh, low cost. Yes. Low cost. Low to medium. We've got a specialty camp we're trying outside um, at our community park. So an outdoor camp that's going to take a little bit more staff. We're going to um, swim at Contra Loma Regional Park. We're going to walk up the hill in that. So that requires a little bit more staff. So it's about a $10 more price yeah, point just so we get that extra staff person in there. And just so I'm clear, because I've heard this thrown around a couple times. We have these programs and nobody's using them. Is that a true statement? That is not a true statement. Okay, I just want to be clear about that. Uh, those are all the questions I had in terms of so what I, I need. I do have a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, the open the open gym, is that only during the summer? Yes. Our gym is at capacity during the winter, so that's when we move into our junior uh, Warriors basketball program. Um, so because we have a standalone gym in the community, a lot of folks um, ask, you know, or they have this perception that it's not used. I will agree with that statement from 8 a.m. to about 11 a.m., and we're constantly looking at um, trend uses for our adult population that has free time in those hours. But from three o'clock on in the community, when you have one gym, everybody's standing in line to rent it. So we have church leagues. So our church and our faith community that has basketball programs, <coughs> they are able to rent the gym for extra coaching time. We have our own programs, um, other CYO, AAU programs, adult programs will then utilize the gym for rentals. Um, to get extra practice time in and so it's balancing that rental time to serve that part of the community with our own creative programs on getting um, you know families and engaged so we're staff is here sometimes until 10 o'clock at night because we like we're able to start at 9 p.m and and during the open gym time during the summer you're saying we have between three and 35 three and 35 per, I mean, and that, you know a lot of it's weather driven you know i talk about the weather all the time if we have a really hot Memorial Day weekend, we know we'll have a successful water park season because everybody's in summer mode early. If we have a cold Memorial Day weekend, people aren't thinking about summer for two or three more weeks, and by then, from our perspective, summer is almost gone. And this is not, this isn't any, um, it, it's not a critical statement of the school district, it's an observation, but school calendars are changing. 
and summer out of school programming time is shrinking. Yep. So that's going to be a challenge not for us or for school, that's going to be a challenge for community. Right. So, uh, I'm sorry, did you have a... I do, yeah. I, um, from the standpoint of, so, so the open gym, three to 35 participants, what are we doing as an organization? I know we have all of these touches. We have these preschool programs where parents are engaged, they're at capacity. What are we doing for that middle to high school age student um, to really attract them? Because uh, that's really where I feel there's a need. So what are we doing? So the biggest need is middle school. Um, really, by the time kids get to be high school, they have completely different needs and a completely different thought process. But that's where we step to the plate with employment opportunities. We're the single largest youth employer in um, the region. You've heard me say that over and over again. We have nearly um, you know, 200 young people working here. So their need becomes one of, of learning how to become an adult. That's the role we step into. So we want to focus on middle school. They, you know, they still somewhat are controlled by their parents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and so that's when we want to capture their role in community. So that is an, a, a moving target. Um, kids' interests change. Um, their trends, forecasting that becomes very uh, creative. So from open gym to our um, council of teens, so as I mentioned, we're doing junior leader um, camps this summer. Um, and actually our staff in interviewing for the water park had six kids say, oh, I, was a, I took junior guard camp and I was a volunteer two summers ago. So that it's working. When they have those experiences and then when they get to the next phase of their life, we've got a connection, they make a better resident, better community, and a better employee individual. So we're, we're getting there and it's just um, looking at how we exponentially grow the numbers of those. And quite frankly, that is a staffing component because we're the mentors for these kids. The workforce of our department is temporary and seasonal staffing. And that's, um, that's a budget issue on just numbers and positions. Right. We want to bring more of that to parks in neighborhoods, again, addressing the transportation issues and the community issues of why do we have to bring kids here? <coughs> what can we do in our own neighborhoods to address all of those things? Because one day they might be interested in painting something, but then the next day they're interested in flying drones. Uh, and so it's capturing that, which is one reason why we've been activating the skate park. Again, not every kid is involved in the three popular sports of football, basketball, and baseball. Kids are have you know, multiple interests that ebb and flow. So okay. All right. um, that's what we have the opportunity for. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Did you have another? I have one question for, for Donnie. Um, so we have we're we right now you we have programs in nine schools, Title I schools. What programs do we have on this side of town from the standpoint of that schools that may not be Title I schools, but parents that two working parents that don't get home till six or seven? Nada. And that's the majority of call. I mean that's calling it, not sugarcoating anything. I get twenty, thirty calls a week. Parents. Danny, that was a great answer. Nada, because <laughs> we have to. I want to make sure we I keep know, going. Yeah, to keep it short, but and, and so, but yeah, more, most of my calls are parents looking for places for their kids to become engaged and be safe. And we don't run anything after school, right? So that's correct. The city used to. That, many, that, many that that's ago. a good answer. That's a good <laughs> answer. Are there any questions in the audience that anybody would like to ask? So I'm gonna. I'll, you go first. And then Don Morrow. Super simple. Where is, the, is this the, the gym is here? Yes, it is. Okay. I just, I have not heard of the gym being open. I, I don't know where you guys. We're offering tours people. during the break, so we'll show you what <laughs> 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 well, we have available. Absolutely. And how, how are you letting people know about this open gym? So we have samples of um, flyers on the back. Feel free to, to take, take them. We're working on our summer guide now. But our department uses quite a layered approach of getting information out of the community. From social media to standard press releases, uh, the workhorse of how we share information is our recreation guide that comes out three times a year. This is what the summer guide cover will look like. It's in production, um, staff is uh, editing it now. It'll go to the printer uh, next week and be in the mail mid-March. So this is what you wanna keep an eye out for. Uh, it has community information and it will have a list of all of our summer programs. It promotes our um, Recreation Health Expo. For the first time ever, we have our summer concert lineup in here. 
We know who's playing our summer concerts already, so it's really okay. evolving into a really cool document. But anyhow, examples of these, feel free to take a look. So pass. Open Gym will be in the rec guide? Yes, it is. Okay, so Open And every household in Antioch gets the rec yes, in the household. mail. Don, you had a question? Um, Nancy, I just, you mentioned the high-density neighborhoods and trying to get programming. Do you have any program going at Sycamore or any of Yes, we do. And where do you host those things? Do you have a facility down there or you just... Um, this is where we, we activate, we bring mobile recreation to the parks. So our summer program is four weeks and we do three parks, City Park, Crosserville Park, and Contra Loma Estates Park. And it rotates those parks one day, um, each week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And so and it is, we those? do. Uh, yeah. Hardworking families, so stories of a family who you know, didn't have a, a daycare arrangement, couldn't afford camps, this program was a lifesaver. She could, the parent could do doctor's appointments and take her children to a safe place. And it was affordable, we accept donations, but it's completely free. Yeah. Siblings, we'll have two, three, and four kids participate in this program. Uh, and it's just, it's a, it gives them a camp experience in a park that meets their needs. And, and uh, Danny also has Beat the Streets, which is more for middle and high schoolers. It's a place to go um, get homework help. They can do some online research. It's Where is that? Small. It's it's right in the Rivertown Habitat buildings. It's called Beat the Streets. Oh, that old oh the resource center. It's very small, very neighborhood focused, yeah. and a good place for a kid to go. But it's not a school program. It's not a school program. It's okay. it's a CDO type program. Okay. I've spoken to them a couple of times. Can't figure and if out and if I can clear it, so. The programs we're now running, the mobile programs, we only did that one time this past summer, and that came out of one-time funding. Well, we've, no, we've been doing that program for four years. I thought we started that. So, um, no, what we're doing is we're slow, slowly <coughs> shifting it from being all 100% grant funded into our base budget. Oh, okay, so the okay. So, one-time okay. <coughs> excuse us, we're able to um, hire a dedicated camp director. Oh, good. Instead of staff floating around, and that was, um, that improved the program immensely. So that's going to be in your budget, right? Yes, okay, yes. good. <laughs> uh, question here and then a question here. Um, yes, Nancy, you spoke about the obesity rate uh, within our kids and yes. wanting to utilize oh, the uh, yeah, social sure. parts Five, within the neighborhood. Uh, the only thing is, is, I mean, that's a great idea, we'll but you might you know, ask yourself, why don't parents utilize that or why don't children? I mean, with the homeless uh, you know, activity that goes on in our parks, drug use and stuff, you know, parents don't want their kids exposed to that. And I know that's something that, you know, is out of your hands. That's more like with these two gentlemen up here in the front, uh, an issue about that. But, you know, how can, you know, families or, you know, parents, kids want to utilize parks when, you know, you don't want to take a kid to a park or you don't want to let your kid go to the park when, you know, there's drug use going on there, there's, you know. So what's, what's, so what's, so what's the question? What's, what's the question? So, it, so the solution, the question is sort of how we are um, addressing that challenge. Okay. The, okay. the solution to that community challenge is um, required by all of us participating. So it's not just a funding solution, it's right. not just a staffing solution, and it's not just a parent's perspective solution or challenge. All of us have to work together. Um, but homelessness in parks is something across the country that every community is addressing with respect and with um, the, uh, the outcome of engaging everybody in our parks. It's not illegal to be homeless. They have a right to be in a park just like everybody else. So it's a matter of coming together to change those perspectives. And the number one um, response to that from our perspective is activation. So that's what we've been marching towards is getting the tools through funding and um, budget re requests to have a little bit more staff and the tools and resources to go into those neighborhoods and activate those parks. The more that we activate those parks and bring all of us together, then the use changes and the pride and feeling and neighborhood connection to park changes and that's the solution. So are you working with uh, the city council, city officials, are they partnering with you to kind of... Oh yes, absolutely. So probably our most creative approach to that right now is, uh, cr is developing and building our mobile recreation van uh, and not having the $200,000 to you know, buy a brand new van and outfit it. Uh, we got very creative and again, that's through our council connections and um, committee roles they have with other agencies. So we are repurposing a Tri-Delta Transit half bus into a mobile recreation van and everyone looks at me with that smile and that like, how is that gonna be possible? It's very exciting. Julie's working with us on this project, and wait till summer comes. You're going to see this really cool opportunity in the community. 
Thank you. And this is uh, the last question because then we have to go take a break and then go to the next panel. And... Got it. Um, well, it's it kind of transformed because you mentioned CEO. I have no idea what that even stands for. Oh, so community-based you... organization, nonprofit. Sorry. That wasn't my question. It just happened. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, I'll cut it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then it turned to something else really quick. I don't think the homeless issue is their issue. I think it's not our issue. It's kind of like gentrification. You can't be mad at gentrifiers if you don't see, if you don't see value in your own community and you leave it. So if you want to deal with homelessness, us going to the parks where they are and humanizing them helps. So that's my opinion on that. Um, for you guys in general, I had no idea. I've been, been here almost 10 years. I had no idea there were teen communities outside of the one at the library on East 18th. Is there any way for someone who, you know, I'm in the age, I don't see those magazines, I don't. So how do we, with social media or any other thing, kind of get a hold of the things that you guys have going on with kids so that we can, I, I love to volunteer. Then there's a lot of parents that can find the time to volunteer if we even knew question. how to contact you guys. We gotta so have how, a question. That, that is my question, no so question. how can we contact you so that we can be more involved? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and a lot of people think that it should be just be a one-way street that we have to tell you 50 times about one thing. But again, it's not. It's everybody being engaged and um, involved. So this is mailed to every household three times a year. And we start promoting and telling everyone to watch for it. Um, and we encourage you to keep it. Like you said, you might get it and then it's gone in a week. Keep it. It's sort of the community you know, go-to book for, for four months worth of time. But again, it's being engaged with social media. It's calling. So now that you know that it's here, call us, we'll get you engaged. So it's, it's, it's bold, it's us getting the information out, but we're relying on our homeowners to be involved as well in the community and just start picking up the phone and calling or looking on social media, talking to your neighbors, the opportunities are there. Okay, so with that, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end it there. I wanna, we'll end it there for this panel, but I do wanna recognize a few people who are here. Uh, Johnny Rodriguez, who's on the Brentwood City Council, and we have, Oh, Mr. Oh. Holland White, who's on the Pittsburgh City Council, and uh, his boss was watching us on Facebook Live. Federal Glover was here watching. Uh, and then we have uh, Sierra Brown from Senator Glazier's office, so thank you for being here with us today. I think it's outstanding that our uh, elected leaders at the state and county level are, are engaged in this process. Uh, oh, and Don Morrow, who's representing Diane Burgess, and I'm sure Diane Burgess uh, would have been here herself, but she uh, is recovering from, a, uh, from surgery. Uh, but again, critically important, and, and I think we're on to something if, uh, if our state leaders are watching what we're doing. Uh, and so with that, we're going to go to break, and I'm going to end it, okay. and then you can say whatever. And city Manager Ron Bernal. Oh, City Manager Ron Bernal. I'm sorry, Ron.